Psalm 23, part 34. It's a blessing to be here to study under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Psalm 23, which is so full of life, so full of things that you and I can relate to in our day-to-day -day living, and especially which brings great encouragement to our souls when we feel so forlorn and down. But thank God, God is a God of all comfort. God is a God who puts us back on our feet. And God is a God who loves us unconditionally. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. You can never match this kind of a God with anything that you and I know in the natural. And uh, we have moved on to Psalm 23, the last part of the Psalm, verse 6. And I've been sharing with you a couple of things about that one particular verse. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We went to Romans chapter 8 verse 28. And we have seen that this verse is a much quoted verse but a very rarely understood verse. Romans chapter 8 verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. It's important for us to know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Even the things that we consider bad ultimately in the long run work out for our good. It's in this context that you begin to see the dynamic nature of this God who we say is a sovereign God. Most of the times the devil wants us to believe that when bad things happen, Bad things happen in such a way that God has lost control over it and he is helpless. He is someone who lacks the ability to set things right immediately and therefore he is as powerful as the almighty God. But this verse disproves once and for all that kind of a mindset. In fact, this verse is such a powerful verse that it brings before our understanding that God is all-powerful, that God is sovereign, that nothing happens that God's lost control over, that in the final analysis, someday you will find that what you thought was meant by the devil for bad, turned around for good, and it worked out for good in your life. Look at the answer that Joseph gave to his brethren, when they stood before him, he had faced tremendous rejection. I mean, they wanted him killed. In the book of Genesis, you read about how it was, a, but for one brother's intercession, all the rest were united that this young boy must be killed. Because they didn't like him. They thought he was a person who was walking in pride. When he was bringing before them the vision of God and the plan of God for his life, they didn't understand him. And in fact, they never wanted to come and see that vision ever come to pass. Because he had clearly lined up the vision before them and said, you will someday come and fall before me. And immediately, his brothers hated the vision. They never considered it a God-given vision. They wanted him killed. And the Bible tells us, it was one brother who stood up, spoke for him, delivered him from the other brother's hands, and he was sold into the hands of the Midianites who would then take him into Egypt and then sell him there into Potiphar's house. And it was one terrible struggle for this young teenaged boy till he came to the age of 30, moving from place to place to place, never in a comfort zone, but in tremendous hardship. And then finally, when he is made the prime minister of Egypt, he sees his brother come there to receive help from his own hands. And then he tells them only one thing. After he's completely stood before them and made himself known to them, he says, what you meant for evil, God turned it around for good. Hallelujah. 
I mean, you meant it for evil. Did I feel bad at that time? Sure, I felt bad at that time. I mean, you can see the entire pathos in that life of this young man when he sees his younger brother for the first time. He is not able to control himself. The Bible says till then he's been putting on a tough front. He goes into a side room and he weeps, weeps and weeps and then wipes his face and comes back and sits there. And it's amazing because we see that rejection is not something so easy to handle. But thank God, our God is well able to turn what people meant for evil around. Hallelujah. That in the final analysis, you and I will be able to declare much like Joseph did. What you meant for evil, God turned it around for good. And see what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. See what the Lord has done. And I'm talking about any kind of failure. Please listen. It's in this context that you see that you're never a, really a failure when you come to Jesus Christ. <laughs> you're never a failure. Because what the devil highlights now as a failure is not a failure. Because in the final analysis, you will find that in the time when he thought you failed and he projected failure as a major issue before your eyes, that was the time that you saw and came that close to God than in any other part of your life. So if you really look at it, what the devil meant for evil, God turned around for good. He walked with you, he talked to you, he stood with you. And when no one ever understood, his shoulder was always there. Where you could lean on and receive comfort and strength in times of need. Hallelujah. Isn't it amazing? That's what the sheep are proud about. That's why they keep declaring, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. They didn't say just in one part of the year. The sheep didn't declare. This happens once in a while. No. All the days of my life. All the days of my life. All the days of my life. And I believe that we need to know that this ought to be the way we confess and we declare every single day. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Why? Because all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called or the ecclesia or the church according to his purpose. That means God has purpose something in your life. And let me tell you this, the devil is out to destroy it. But thank God, he doesn't understand the plans of God. He does not understand the purposes of God. You do. You do. And that's the reason why we are always one step ahead of the devil. One step ahead of the devil. Some time ago I had written in the newsletter about why Napoleon stood out as a great general when it came to, you know, winning wars. He said, I'm always there even before they expect that I'll be there. <laughs> I'm always one step ahead of them. And when it comes to the Christian believer's life, you are always one step ahead of the devil. He's not ahead of you. And I can prove it from scripture simply because dwelling on the inside of you is the living God. And the living God is not behind the devil. He is always up front. He is way, 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 way ahead of the devil. In his thinking, in his ways of delivering, in his methods of you know, communicating, he is way ahead of the devil. And he dwells on the inside of you. And when he dwells on the inside of you, please listen and listen well. God will keep you always a step ahead of the devil. A step ahead of the devil. And your life will always be a life of great productivity. Now we are going to be looking at this. This morning. Now, the love of one who loves his sheep, that is the shepherd, is the one that we see being reflected in the work that the shepherd does as well as the love that the sheep have in return for the shepherd. It's a two-way process. 
Come with me to John's Gospel, please. John's Gospel, chapter 10 and verse 11. Now, this is Jesus speaking. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. We'll stop there for a moment. Often we have read the verse, I am the good shepherd. And we have understood it always in the context of Jesus projecting himself as the good shepherd. But remember, when David spoke about it, he was referring to Jehovah, the great I am, that I am as being the good shepherd. Now look at how Jesus was declaring it. He said, I am the good shepherd. That means as sheep, everything that you require, you will find in me. Your protection, your deliverance, your provision, the leading you require, the places where you will want to walk, every single detail of that, you will not find it on the terrain. You'll find it in me. Because I am the good shepherd. Let's read on. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now how do you rate a good shepherd? If he or she is prepared to lay down his or her life for the sheep. That's how you rate a good shepherd. There are instances of Tremendous bravery. Over the years since the time of David or even before David's time, that shepherds who have qualified themselves as good shepherds have often brought to the fore in times of great threat to their sheep. And it's amazing that this concept of giving his life for the sheep was literally something that Jesus applied to himself also. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. That means whenever the good shepherd looks at a sheep, he is looking at his life outpoured. Amen. Just write it down. Just yesterday someone was talking to me about how much it costs to get a medical seat. And this young man looked at me and said, that's the cost of a Mercedes Benz. So I laughed and said, the next time you see a Mercedes Benz goes, Go past you. Say, there goes a medical seat. Please listen very carefully. When the shepherd looks at sheep, he's not looking just as, at it as something he owns. It becomes something so personal to him. It's his life there out walking. And that's how Jesus looks at you. It's no wonder then that the devil can't just come into your life and wreck your life. Please listen very, very carefully. Listen to this very carefully. The devil wants you to believe he can just walk in at will and wreck your life. He can do what he wants. He can get his way in your life because he is still boss. But the thing that you must understand is that he is not your boss any longer. You are under a different management. You are under a different management. And this management quota is not something you pay for, it's already paid for. And it's paid for with the shepherd's own life. So nobody can just jump in. Nobody can just walk in. The devil can't just come in and, you know, wreck your life. He can't. Look at 1 John chapter 3 verse 16, please. 1 John chapter 3 verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. Now I want you to see something there. Remember what we saw in John's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 11. How do I perceive the love of God? He didn't say the love of Jesus. He didn't say the love of Jesus. And this is a man who walked with Jesus, who talked with Jesus, who saw Jesus. Now John is going back to the great I am that I am. Because it is out of the great I am that I am that Jesus proceeded as the living word. So how do I perceive the love of God? How do I perceive the love of the Father? Because he laid down his life for us. He laid it down. For who? 
circle the word us and write close to me I am included in that word it's me that verse includes me and in the next latter half of that verse we're going to say something else and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren that means you live your life for the brethren rather than for yourself you'll have less fights you'll have less disagreements you will have less frictions when you're living your life considering the brethren before yourself but is that what we do is a question we don't do it because seldom do we see what jesus did we'll sing of course here in a controlled atmosphere of praise and worship oh the blood of jesus oh the blood of jesus but the moment we leave this place and we're out we're again letting ourselves jump up and take first place our flesh takes first place it's not the brethren that we are considering we are considering ourselves i'm not considering the brethren i'm considering myself so what do i do when i consider myself i keep doing the things that the self dictates regardless of whether the brethren are going to be affected by it or not so just like you wrote close to the word us right close to the word we I and I ought to lay down my life for the brethren if this is the case there are certain questions we'll be dealing with this morning that are pertinent to every Christian believer and I like you to write it down because they all line up with how sheep are if I ought to lay down my life for the brethren not for the family that's what we always do this is my family i lay down my life for the family he didn't say family he said brethren he's talking about people in the church body of christ that means we've got to live our lives in such a way that we look beyond the borders and boundaries of ourselves and we begin to look at the body of christ and value it highly now this is not the only place that you will see the body of christ being valued highly when you read 1st Corinthians chapter 11 there again you will read of how when people don't respect the body and partake of holy communion whether it is seen and reflected in the symbolic representation of the body of Christ in the wafer or the spiritual concept of the body of Christ which is the church what happens is people become sickly and weak and there are many who die before their time prematurely many many Paul didn't say few that means it's time for many in the church to take a clear purview of their own lives in the light of scripture and whether they do value the body of Christ highly or not I lay down my life for the brethren now these are a couple of questions we need to be asking ourselves is this outflow of goodness and mercy given just for me to stagnate and stop in life is there no way in which it can pass on through me to benefit others it's good to say goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life but is it just given for me does it end with me do i come to a place where i stagnate and then begin to die or can this goodness and mercy flow out from me to others the good news is there is a way and this aspect often eludes many people now what is that is what we're going to be looking at God intends for each believer to be a positive vessel through which goodness and mercy can flow to others now this is God's intended purpose God wants to see it happen God intends for it to happen and God expects for it to happen he intends for it to happen he is purposed for it to happen and he expects it to happen that means if you take a good look at yourself you were meant to be a vessel out of which goodness and mercy would flow to others now the way in which this operates will become clear to us when you look at it in the context of sheep in the natural now when we began our teachings on 
Psalm 23, we saw how sheep who are mismanaged can be the most destructive of livestock. In fact, in a short time they can ruin and ravage land almost beyond remedy. But in contrast, if they are properly managed, of all the livestock, sheep are the most beneficial because their manure is the best balanced of any produced by domestic stock, their manure. When this manure is scattered efficiently over the pastures, it proves to be an enormous benefit to soil. I'm going to be showing you something. Please write it down. We're not talking about manure. We're talking about something that relates to us in our Christian life. But you understand that sheep can be productive. They can also be very, very destructive. All depends on who's managing them. For example, the sheep's habit of seeking the highest rise of ground on which to rest ensures that the fertility from the rich lowland is de redeposited on the less productive higher ground by way of droppings. That means what's happening is that sheep are not just going from the lowlands to the uplands, they are becoming a blessing on the uplands also. Something that comes out of them is revamping the land, making it once again fertile, once again bringing a type of productivity on places of less productivity. In fact, like we've already seen, no other livestock will consume as wide a variety of herbage as sheep does. Sheep eat all sorts of weeds and especially plants that are undesirable, which may otherwise invade a very good field. For example, they love the buds that come out of thistles, which if not controlled, can literally wipe out an entire field. And especially some of them are very noxious weeds. Now one of the concepts that you must understand about thistles are thistles will literally choke. Any other good plant that is planted on a field, if they are allowed to spread unchecked. But if someone manages sheep well, sheep can keep weeds out of the land. Can I have an amen? That's you, my friend. You can keep the evil out. You can keep things that are unpleasant out of the good land. Hallelujah. The promised land. The place that God said you will enjoy. An outflow of God's blessing and abundance as a land flowing with milk and honey. In fact, when well-managed sheep are let into places that are overgrown with this kind of thistles and weeds, they once again restore a place like no other creature can do. And that's God's purpose. This earth is ravaged with uncleanness, with weeds, with obnoxious thistles, with, thi with, with things that not only threaten to choke, but which are so dangerous. And God's depending on you, my friend, to get the junk out. Hallelujah! Depending on you. Is that, isn't that amazing? You thought God's the one who's going to do it all. He's saying, no, I'm depending on you. You do it. You do it. You get the junk out. You clear up the place. If it's in your home, get the junk out. If it's in your society, be a man and a woman who's not just a social reformer. Be a man and a woman who will be a spiritual influence. Because that's God's plan for you. He is depending on you to do it. Write it down. He is depending on you. In ancient literature, sheep were referred to as those of the golden hoofs. That was how sheep were referred to. Those with the golden hoofs. Why? Because they were highly regarded and esteemed for their beneficial effect on the land when they were well managed. In other words, goodness and mercy can follow flocks that leave behind something worthwhile, productive, beautiful and beneficial 
to both themselves and others. Just write down the four things. Worthwhile, that means something of worth. Then, productive, beautiful and beneficial. So wherever sheep walks and they are well managed, those places become places of fertility and weed free land. Seven says, Brother so and so walked this place in the year 19 something. What happened after he walked the land? Well, when he came in, there was idolatry in the land, there was uncleanness in the land. And he just came in, he was minding his own business or so it looked. But then all of a sudden we started seeing a change happen. He wouldn't come out, he would sit there, pray. And before long people started flocking to that place. Slowly the local bar closed up. Because nobody felt it had anything to offer any longer. And where there were no churches, now we have 12 churches. Because so and so walked the land. Where sheep who are well managed live. There remains behind beauty and abundance. Beauty and abundance. Now again we got to ask a couple of questions. I encourage you not to listen to these questions. To write them down also. And to ponder on these questions. As you come to this place in Psalm 23. And especially verse 6. The question is, or the questions are, do I leave a blessing or a benediction behind me? Wherever I go, or am I a curse in that place? Do people who take one look at me groan in their spirits and say, oh, I wish he had never come here. Things turned out so bad after he arrived. What would you like your life to be a blessing and a benediction? Or it's something that people would groan about. So Alfred Tennyson wrote in one of his great classic poems. The good men do lives after them. Do I leave a trail of sadness or gladness behind me? When I arrive in a place. Are people glad that I have arrived? Or are they sad when they take a look at me? Is my memory in others minds entwined with mercy and goodness? Or would they rather forget me altogether as a bad dream? Very hard questions. But they are questions we, nevertheless that we must ask, ponder on and come to a right conclusion when we come to Psalm 23 verse 6. Do I deposit a blessing behind me or am I a bane to others? Is my life a pleasure to people or a pain? Have you ever heard people say such a pain? <laughs> You are such a pain. Sometimes we rarely understand that much of what we hear are as a result of never submitting ourselves to the right kind of management under the good shepherd's hand. That's why people look at and say, you are such a pain. <laughs> well, we need to have people saying you are such a blessing. Hallelujah. And that's not flattery. I'm not talking about flattery. I'm talking about people who are really profiting from your being around. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet, the golden hoofs of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Hallelujah. When Zion is sitting and wondering, Has God forgotten me? Here comes this little sheep with golden hoofs who stands there tall in Zion and declares, Thy God reigneth. And I can prove this to you right now with an example. After you have written, Close to that place, how beautiful upon the mountains are the golden hoofs. Golden hoofs. Golden hoofs. Look at a terrified Israel. Standing before the threat of one man called Goliath. Here's a backslidden king. Terrified 
of ever having to go and confront the enemy and I ball him face to face. Entire Israel is wondering whether there is a God in Israel at all. When here comes a little shepherd boy with golden hoofs. He's coming with what? The gospel of deliverance. Salvation. The moment he begins to speak, his elder brother or his older brothers look at him with disdain and ask him a question. In whose hands did you leave those little group of sheep that was entrusted into your hands? How dare you come here? This is our territory. We are fighting men. You are just a shepherd boy. What they didn't understand was this boy was a boy with golden hoofs. He had seen the living God. The great I am. In confrontation with the enemy twice earlier. And each time he had come out the winner. When he had eyeballed the lion face to face holding on to its mane. The lion didn't see a young boy grabbing its mane. The lion saw the very great I am that I am in that boy's eyes. The same happened when he went after the bear. Got the bear by its beard. The Bible says, twice, David declared, The Lord delivered me from the mouth of the lion and the paw of the bear. And this man, this uncircumcised Philistine, this man who doesn't know covenant, will be as one of them. As far as David was concerned, they were already dead, stinking carcasses. They were dead, stinking carcasses. They were not living creatures any longer. He said, what you're seeing living, moving around and bragging is nothing more than a headless corpse for me. And he said, all Israel will know that there is a God in Israel because I'm not going up against this man in my name. I'm going up against this man in the name, the God of the armies of Israel, whom this man has defied. Golden hoofs. I'm not using this word in a light way. You are that person. The question is, are you seeing yourself like that or not? Many don't. They have no word of deliverance to offer anybody in need, except to join in in the complaining and the whining and the murmuring against a living God. David could have. He chose not to. Imagine it's one boy against all Israel. It's one shepherd boy against all Israel. Let me tell you something. There will be times when you will have to stand all alone for the Lord. But if you will take your stand properly, the entire people who you thought were against you will turn around and start following you. They will. They can never resist. They will have to follow. Look at what the Bible says. After Goliath was killed, the Bible says, not me, the Bible says, there was a shout that went up in Israel. And the Israelites immediately took after the entire army of the Philistines. And there was a great slaughter. And who was the hero of the day? Not David's elder brother, Eliab. Not any of the ones who are mentioned there. The hero of the day was not even King Saul. The hero of the day was this young shepherd boy. Because the people came out singing and dancing. And saying Saul had slain his thousands. David his ten thousands. Ten times more honor was given to the shepherd lad. Because his pride was based on the living God. Not on the arm of flesh. What are you priding yourself this morning? It's a question you must ask yourself. If you're priding yourself in the wrong stuff, please set your life right, right now. Don't pride yourself in nothing that has in whole value in the sight of God. Paul called everything that the world had to offer as dung. Can I have an amen, please? Are you seeing the correlation in Psalm 23 and what? Paul would later talk to us about. He said, everything the world had to offer, I consider it as nothing but done. For the excellency of the knowledge of my Lord Jesus Christ. That means, I believe that the value of the understanding I have and the revelation of, uh, I have of the living God far outweighs in value anything that I know in the natural. Everything else is junk. 
It's of no use. Little but dung in my sight. Look at verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains. From the lowlands, sheep go up to the uplands. On the mountain top, shouted out from the housetop that our God lives, that our God's in charge, that He is a miracle working God. Jesus didn't ask you to shout it out from the closet, He said from the rooftops. From the rooftops, from the places of the highest vantage that you can see God's promise far unlike anyone else can when they're way down in the valley. Shout it out from those places that your God is alive, that your God is powerful, that he's in charge of your life. And there is deliverance because the church is the body of Christ, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. There is a God in the church this day and his name is Jesus. He is a living God. He is not an idol. He is not a theory. He is not even a philosophy. He is a living God. In closing, I'd like to add a couple of more questions that you can write down. Please. They are very simple questions, but they are powerful questions. Do I leave behind peace in lives or turmoil? You'd rather ha not have some relatives come to your house. Why? Because they are trouble. They don't look at me strange. They are trouble. I'm on rock record this morning. They're trouble. You'd rather not have them in your house because they're tail bearers. They're gossipers. They're backbiters. They don't leave behind peace. They leave turmoil. They'll take something from your mouth and before they left the place, they've already told your neighbor something else about you. When you've gone, they've left the house, they've gone away. And you are wondering why on earth is my neighbor not looking at me and smiling. Till yesterday she was okay. Then you start tracing the history of the day. And you will find out that after a particular point of time, after this so-called relative or this so-called friend you let into your house, spoke to her for 10 minutes. That's a long time for some of them. Just 10 minutes. So after that the smile became a stare. So the question you, meet, you and I have got to ask ourselves is, do I leave peace in lives or turmoil? Do I leave behind forgiveness or bitterness? Even when you're meeting with people who have been wronged, do you add salt on the wound, stir up bitterness, or are your words healing balm that brings comfort and strength to them, that they can in turn forgive? Remember, forgiveness is a choice. Just write it down while we are at it. Let's just look at it a little bit in brief. Forgiveness is a choice, not a feeling. When you forgive, you release the other man or the woman or the individual who's wronged you, a family. And in doing it, please listen, this is where people have a problem. They think that if I release him, it's like I release him and... He's going to get off the hook. No. When you release him, you open yourself up to blessing. But in releasing him, you place the man in the hands of the living God. Now, you maintain a righteous life while God who is the righteous one is in charge of dealing with that individual or that family or whoever has wronged you. He or she can never escape. Never. There have been instances of people passing away from this earth before they saw with their own eyes the judgment of God coming on the ones who have wronged them because they simply didn't repent. They are not around, but God didn't forget. God didn't forget. That's why it's good for you to forgive. You release the man. You release the woman. You release the one who's wronged you. The family, just release them. You be righteous in the sight of God. You be Christ-like. Now it becomes his responsibility, his prerogative, and his duty to see that because you were wronged, he fights for you. And believe me, it's an awful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. You can attempt a lot of other things in the natural, but you don't play in that area. It's a terrible things, thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. So forgiveness 
is a choice. Then, do I leave behind contentment or conflict? That means, when I enter a place, do I speak about God is good? God is a God of peace, contentment, goodness. I am deeply satisfied because I have been walking with the Lord this long, 21 years. I have seen the Lord in the land of the living. I have seen bad times. I have seen good times. But I have seen something. God never left me any time. There is deep contentment in my spirit, in my heart. Or do I leave behind conflict? That means after I left the place, is that conflict that rages in the man's mind who I have been interacting with. Conflicting thoughts. There's a sense of bitterness and hatred against God as though God did a peculiar number just on you that he didn't do on anyone else. Where God is made to look like culprit and the devil like saint. There are people like that. You better keep them out of your home. Just one amen. I want a better response. You better keep unclean friends out of your house. If they come and stir up conflict, Division, discord, disharmony, where you are always questioning the will of God, the plan of God, the purpose of God. And every statement of God is considered a threat to you rather than a blessing. Then you are with wrong companionship. You are with wrong friends. You are with wrong relatives. They don't have a place in your life. And it's time you laid the axe to the root and get the unclean out so that the clean can be established in your life. Remember God intended for you to be people with golden hoofs. Finally, do I leave behind flowers of joy or weeds of frustration? Flowers of joy or weeds of frustration? Do I leave behind love or Rancor. Weeds of frustration frustrate. They make it look so helpless that God can't bail you out of this situation. Who told you that? There's a statement years ago that I read that was made by a great woman of God called Corrie Ten Boom. She had written in one of her books, There is no pit too deep that God can't bring you out of it. And she is a woman who could say it with utter confidence. Because she was a woman who was persecuted for no reason other than that her father helped Jews escape from the hands of their Nazi persecutors. And because of it, the entire family that were living together, because her father was a watchmaker, was just grabbed separated, thrown into different concentration camps and that was the last that she got to see of her father whom she loved so much. She saw her sister die in prison and then miraculously her life was spared and she came out of prison to be a great woman of God who would go around the world preaching the glorious gospel and publishing the good tidings that Jesus is saviour and healer all over the world. But then there was something that she said in that book that literally shook me just before she came out with this statement. She said many, many years later, as part of coming to a place where she would reconcile herself to God's desire that she forgive, she decided to travel back to see that concentration camp. And while she was there, God showed her something that she said made her understand grace in a completely new dimension altogether. She said she went into the concentration camp. She was allowed to go through the books that was written and she was shown her name and number there on the books. Then, all of a sudden, the man who was showing her the books discovered something. He looked at her and said, with tears in his eyes, count yourself lucky that you are alive. And she looked at him in a strange way. She didn't understand what he was saying. And he said, look here. And he pointed at the book. And there in the book, what was written, was the name of someone else 
sounding similar to hers. And there was a clerical error made there. And instead of her going to the gas chamber, she escaped the gas chamber because of a clerical error. And that's when she makes the statement in her book. She said, there's no pit too deep that God can't get you out of it. And I believe that those words, like we read of Abel, though he be dead, yet he liveth and he speaketh. Though she be gone to be with the Lord, yet those words are speaking to us this morning. There's no pit too deep that God can't get you out of it. So don't let the devil lie to you when we are not around. When you're all alone, God's lost control over your life. It's going to be like this, it's going to be like that and he shows you the worst kind of scenario. He works, shows you the worst picture of how you will go steadily down the drain. He can go down the drain if he wants. But you will go up and up in life. Because your life as far as God is concerned is patterned according to his perfect plan and purpose. You are a called out vessel. Out of whom goodness and mercy will flow. Can I have an amen please? That's you. You look at yourself and say, I am meant to be someone with golden hoofs. Wherever I go, my life was meant to be a blessing, not a curse. Amen? amen. Praise God. We'll continue this next week. And I believe it's going to get as interesting as it was when we started this psalm. In fact, it's only now you're going to see various dimensions to Psalm 23 manifesting in your practical everyday living. Amen. Praise God. This concludes Pastor Isaac's message.